grace. Would you turn with me to Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 19? And there's our old good friend Don. There is a YouTube video that was very interesting. Uh, I don't know. I didn't know all the people in it. I only um, I, Todd White was one of the people in it, but it was a it was like a little forum, and they had a question: Why don't people get healed? And they had some very good answers. Um, sadly, uh, I, I guess none of all of them maybe are very anointed healers. Uh, they're not theologians. I wish I was telling Susan, I wish they had read some Francis McNutt who was a healer and a theologian because there's a lot more biblical reasons they didn't mention. But the things that they mentioned were very excellent. There just was a lot more things that I thought, well, if you just read Francis McNutt's first book on healing, you'd, you'd know there's a, there's a lot of other biblical things that they didn't speak to. But what they did speak to uh, was really good. And um, um, they had a couple of them had ways of saying things in ways I thought were very like I learned some things in the way that they said it. Not that they were completely new, but helpful. But I, I don't really want to talk about that exactly, but I do want to talk about something that my thoughts were directed from having listened to their 15-minute discussion uh, on a YouTube thing that Pastor Sharon, Pastor Susie, and you know, I don't know how these things get around. In any case, so Mark chapter 9, verse 14 to 19. Uh, let's look at this story. Now, in Matthew chapter 17, we have Matthew's version, which actually... I don't say like more. How do you like more? But but um, since I've done that one recently, in a way, I want to talk about uh, something and correct something um, that I said a while back because I saw another piece here in this, and it was helpful. So anyway, Matthew chapter nine fourteen to, to nineteen. And when he Jesus came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Now, <clears throat> this is really interesting. I do not know. This is. The bad part of having computers, and I read the Bible often on my computer. I have a laptop, and then I copy from Bible Gateway. You can have any thousand, you know, I might look at the New Living, or I might look at this, or New King James, or the NIV. And, and, and uh, But when you have your Bible open, the nice thing is you can see, oh, the transfiguration was right in front of this. <laughs> but when you're just looking at a particular passage, the context of the transfiguration certainly is informative to what's going on here. He's up on the mountain, and of course, God said, the Father says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Okay, and then this big discussion comes about faith, uh, and, and that's, not, uh, that's not disconnected, both the voice of the Father and listening to Jesus, and the authority of that, and the power that was revealed, the glorious manifestation of uh, Jesus' divinity and his eternal personhood as the second person of the Trinity, all this on display on the Mount of Transfiguration. He comes down with three disciples, and there's three groups. There's nine disciples. There's this man who is very disappointed in Jesus' elves. You know, have you ever had people that, like that, that really weren't happy with the pastors and the leaders? I mean, there's all kinds of reasons to be upset with leaders. Good, sadly, there's lots of good reasons. Lots of ones we're not sure about, and, and then there's bad reasons. But, but I mean, this guy, he's upset. I mean, the kid's, kid's dying, and uh, he goes to looking for the power source, and uh, these guys let him down. They're, uh, you know, they had been casting out demons. Nothing's worse than that to see, you know, someone else gets their knee healed, and you don't get your knee healed. Or however, I mean, you know, and he, he's very unhappy, and for good reason. And apparently, we'll see in this text, I believe it's this text that talks about it, he's a pretty good guy. He says one of the most beautiful things in Scripture. Lord, I believe, help thy unbelief. Uh, that's, a, that's a good prayer for all of us to be praying. So he's coming, the scribes are there egging everything on. So you have this sort of uh, movement towards unbelief and uh, uh, antagonism, uh, uh, unbelief as a willful um, sort of, the willful decision not to trust in Jesus, despite his works and his words. That's, that's one kind of unbelief that was going on with the scribes. So, so this big thing's going on, three groups, the disciples, the other, you know, Jesus and the three, the nine and the man complaining and the scribes. So Jesus comes out, there's a big, big commotion going on. Um, so when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and the scribes were disputing with them and immediately when they saw him, ah, 
All the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. Hey, you got a showdown going on here. Uh, we think this kid has is, is, uh, is, is got a demon or something. This is going to be a power encounter. Now, it's interesting. This particular kind of leprosy in Mark is described with the word in Greek for lunatic. Now, I did not know this until I said it. So it's epilepsy in Matthew, but in Mark, it's lunatic because the belief was that epilepsy was influenced by the seasons of the moon. And that when the, which I didn't know that. I don't know if that's, if that's still how people understand, but that the understanding was apparently in that time, and I don't know about today, was that depending upon the moons, people with epilepsy had different, apparently worse, uh, in the moon phases when it was like a full moon, they would have worse uh, manifestations of their seizures. Uh, you know, uh, but the point is in, in Mark, so the word, I think of lunatic as like crazy person. I don't think of it as anything to do with epileptic seizure. I, I think of it like, I'm a, I hate to say it, I think I probably first learned the word from cartoons when I was a child, you know. So I, it's not, I don't have any association typically with that word of having nothing to do with about mental illness, but rather a manifestation of an epileptic seizure uh, that would be throwing a person around. I've seen that, and I think of that as epilepsy. But in any case, Mark says, calls the man a lunatic. So it's referring to, a, it, it's an expression referring to what we would understand as epilepsy, and that's what Matthew calls, uh, the, the, I said the man, the son. What we find out behind the symptoms of that is actually a demon in the case, uh, but not everyone, the Bible does, you know, there's times when Jesus heals an epileptic when he does not describe any connection with a demon. All right, so the point, one, one lesson would be is that in some cases, physical illnesses can have at their source a demonic spirit that once removed the physical ailments immediately and unnaturally, supernaturally departs. That's good news. Now think about it. And sometimes it's amazing when you start to pray for illness, how many times when you pray, if this is of the enemy, in Jesus' name, I command to leave. And how many times that happens? Some of you have told the story, but you know, Susan and I, we were just beginning to, to learn about healing with uh, when John Carl was born. And so when he had, you know, Joy was a little older and a little healthier. When he had all those kind of things, we started experimenting on John Carl. <laughs> he was the guinea pig. Yeah, I mean, he could have, he'd get a bee sting. And I mean, I can remember, you know, no one else at our house. I, mean, I would never have done it in front of anybody else. I thought it sounded crazy. But I started praying for the bee sting. And the kid healed up the bee sting left. I mean, crazy. We just saw thing after thing. It was amazing. And I was, just, I was so surprised. In any case, so they, they, they get excited. Jesus is here. They got, you know, no more second string. Now we got the first strings here. And so, uh, and he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? He knew the source of the irritation was coming from those people who had a willful predisposition and a refusal to believe. And, and, and this is what, what I got a little bit of a mistake when I preached on Matthew in the past. There's two words here for unbelief. It's the same root, but one means this. So you have doubt, which is different than unbelief. Unbelief uh, in the context here, when he talks about the scribes and this guy, the generation, the unbelief is a willful refusal, meaning despite the fact that God's been healing and things have been happening and people have been getting free from demons, there are still some people who refuse to believe that it's Jesus, even when everything is clear it's Jesus. They still uh, refuse. That's called unbelief, okay? Now, there is a word that's similar to the different ending that actually means little faith, and that's a different thing, and that's what he says about the disciples later at the end. I'm going to do the punchline, but, but there's a distinction, um, and... and uh, so here we go. So then one of the crowds, he said, what's going on? What are you discussing with the scribes? All this crowd's here. And then one of the crowds said to him, the guy with the son, teacher, rabbi, right? I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. It, it, it blocks him from speaking. Okay, that's, I probably told you in the, you know, when you deal with a, in, in a psalm, we were part of this revival. We pray for a number of people who were mute and they were healed. And uh, the Muslims, you know, said, uh, that's from idolatry. The Muslims were telling us information. And they basically, yeah, because there's Christians who are monotheists and Muslims who are monotheists do not have children who are mute. That's what they were, that was their anecdotal thing that they told us in Assam. They said, but it's always the Hindus and they're idolaters. So it comes from, uh, it's open door in a sense, they were saying, from idolatry. You know, I, I can't tell you uh, how that all works. But, but I, we did pray for a bunch of people. You know, I'm here, Ernest Ainsley used to make fun of him in my mind. I'm thinking, what would Ernest Ainsley say? That's the thought came to me. You know, in Jesus' name, speak. You know, uh, just simple like that. And, uh, well, then I said, say, say, baby. No. 
So say, that's what Ernest used to say too. They said, say Jesus. And people, I mean, these kids, because they've never heard English before, they said Jesus clears day and the parents begin to weep. And I mean, because it's not just that their kid is suffering and can't talk. It's that their families believe they're cursed. People don't want to do business with them because they think they're cursed. People don't want to marry their cousins and their sisters and their brothers. I mean, to have a child with something like that or to be mentally ill or whatever it might be in those cultures, in a shame-based culture, it means incredible repercussions besides the pain and heartache that you would have for your child as well. But it's, it's way bigger than we can probably appreciate uh, for people in those situations. So I have a, a teacher. I brought you my son who is a mute spirit. And whatever it seizes him. So this guy understood in his mind that this thing was a thing in terms of a demonic, he thought. Now, every time people think it's a demon, it's not necessarily. I've had people come and we just, we just oh, they say they got a demon, we pray, nothing happens. All of a sudden we realize, just because that person thought it was a demon doesn't mean it's a demon, by the way. you know. And uh, on the other hand, there's people who don't think it's a demon, and, and it is. So, but this guy, by his own description, understood it to be a demon. Partly, particularly here in this case, is that when it happened, it seemed like he was that the, the spirit was trying to kill him. So it wasn't just that he was having fits. The nature of the fits were such that it was trying to burn him and, and drown him. And, and because of that, that that's, uh, gave, him, gave him the evidence he needed to determine it was an evil spirit. So whenever it's, it uh, sees him, it throws him down. So he foams in the mouth, gnashes teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Now I could ask a silly question. How many of us have had a spirit that for whatever reason we didn't seem to be cast out? Not immediately. I could, I've had a lot of them. I've had a whole lot of them. We've been cast out right away, but I have had some. In the early days, I want to say for the first six months to a year that I started taking authority over demons, uh, we didn't have a church. The church was built in April. I want to say we came in March or April of 2001, and I moved here in 96, and somewhere probably around 98 or something, I started praying uh, for people who need deliverance. And so uh, you know, we'd have a church. So uh, I would meet them at Cracker Barrel because I needed a public place. A lot of them were women, and, and, but either way, I needed, a, I needed a place, and then I needed kind of a public place. So I would, I would eat, meet them for breakfast, find out what their problem was, and I said, now go out to my, come out to my office. And we'd go out to the rocking chairs. And if you know me, I like to rock, so we'd get on the end. And I'd sort of pray that the people walking by, smoking cigarettes, wouldn't notice us, you know, thing, you know Lord blind. I don't know if they blind, but uh, they were probably pretty freaked. They are probably heading on in, in a hurry. Uh, and I would just sit there and pray quietly. And often when I would be done, nothing seemed to happen. And then I would find it a week later. Oh, nothing seemed to happen. But the next morning when I woke up, I was completely fine. I heard that a lot, a lot of times. That still happens rarely. But in the early days, it was like always, I would only find out. Maybe it was to build up my faith. I, I don't know why. I mean, who knows? It did build up my faith eventually. But at first, it was, you know, it was a struggle when you didn't see any apparent change. Uh, but we had a whole lot of people that sort of like somehow when they slept and woke up, something reset. The angels and demons had had it out. However it works, uh, they were free. But I often wouldn't find out till later. Um, so anyway, so and I had someone that we've had no apparent success with. I mean, Neil Anderson, who's probably humanly speaking, cast out more spirits than anybody maybe in history. I don't know how someone could have been to as many places as he has with a very unique and specific specialty. Uh, and he has taught and helped people in the thousands, and I mean, hundreds of thousands in Russia and Eastern Europe. I mean, if there's any of you guys ever had, you know, the, a, who would guess he'd be a Baptist? A Baptist guy, the most profound ministries of uh, exorcism and deliverance. Um, but he says 15, if you go into his training stuff, he says 15% of the time, for some reason, uh, and it's and other people say this, that there is a group of people. For some reason, people for no, not to blame it. We, we just don't know why we don't seem to be able to help them, and we don't know. So it's it's not uncommon. On the other hand, Jesus wasn't happy about it, which is something to that we might think about. So they went to the disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Nineteen, he, Jesus, answered him and said, "O oh, faithless generation." That is unbelieving. That is like without faith generation, meaning you are willfully refusing to believe and you have seen miracles and signs and things and you're still choosing to be against this. That's what he's saying here. Don's listened to another one of my best sermons. I think that's really good, Don. Thank you. Was that Don? That wasn't you over there? 
Sorry, you're listening to your own, yeah. He was listening to his own sermon over there. You're as bad as Diane. We're going to go. He's like, this, this sermon is boring. I'll listen to my own. That's what he's doing. Oh, the Bible version. He, he, he can't. Okay, there you go. Okay. All right. I, I thought maybe you found a better sermon. Then that would be easy. So I said, if this one's no good, we'll listen to a better one. Thank you, Don. All right. So, O generation without faith. Okay. Unbelieving. Again, willful refusal. I mean, you come to see the, the freak show, but you, you have no intention of submitting yourself to Jesus Christ. That's what he said. You have no interest in the real thing. I, I've seen a lot of people go to healing meetings and things that way. They want to see what might happen, but you know, we really don't want to get around the things of God. If we're not, if it's God, we better be surrendered and submitted. And there's a whole lot of people that want to see the action who have no intention. It's very dangerous. Because we're not only judged by our response to the miracles that happen to us, we are judged by the miracles we've seen God do in people around us. Some people say, oh, I've never seen a miracle, yet their wife was healed of cancer or something. Like, wait a minute. When you know God heals them, you, you, it, it's, that miracle is for you as much as for anybody else. And you're responsible to, to, to have grown and learn and, 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 uh, and, and believe in and through that, your faith growing from having the experience with the living Christ. Anyway, so, faith of generation, how long shall I be with you? Meaning in light of what you've seen and what you've experienced, even the crowds should have been much further along than they were. We find this is also true of the disciples. But he's saying the crowds should be more spiritually deep than they are. I mean, in fact, he's going to kind of get mad at this dad. It's as if he's saying to this guy, it, you yourself, in as much as you love your son, you could have the faith. There's no reason that you, you don't have the faith to operate. There's nothing keeping you from the faith to deal with this yourself. You're looking for the power team, but, but because of the nature of faith is in God and it's God's work, there's nothing and no excuse for you. Bring him to me. How long shall I bear with you? Put up with you because I'm not going to be here forever. And, 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 and you've got this, it's like you got this one window of opportunity. You've got to take it. And you're not taking it. That's what he's saying. Then they brought him, the boy, to him, and when he saw him, immediately. Now, I don't know about your translation, but the New King James says, and when he, small h, saw him, capital H. So what it's suggesting is when the boy comes, I said the boy, he could have been 18, we don't we know it's a son, right? But when the boy, he could have been 10, I don't know. But when he comes, when the demon in the boy sees Jesus in that proximate position, he freaks. So it's not when Jesus saw him, the boy, it's when the spirit in the boy saw Jesus. Okay, so that's why, at least that's the interpretation that the New King James does. I don't know how the NIV does it, but there is a small H and a capital H in the New King James, which is telling us that the translation team believes, which you have to infer one way or other, infers that that's what's going on. Uh, when, not when Jesus looked upon the boy, but when the demon in the boy looked upon Jesus. And when he saw him, the spirit convulsed. Uh, immediately, excuse me, when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, threw him in some kind of fit, and fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he, Jesus, asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? Now, this is a very important question for a lot of things in our healings. When did things start? I cannot tell you how often. Once people realize, oh, it happened right after my divorce. It happened right after someone stole my inheritance, and I, and I said I would never forgive them. Uh, you know, all these things begin, not, not always, but it is amazing how many times when people stop and ask the Lord, what was going on? When did this start? That they begin to discern and realize how some door in their life was open to the thing that they're facing. Oh, I went to Haiti on a mission trip. I never had a rear blood disease until I went to Haiti on a mission trip. That didn't happen. Let me just say People start, oh, oh, yeah, I never had all this suicidal thoughts. I never was super depressed. But then I went into a Muslim country preaching the gospel. Ah, huh. maybe that has something to do with it. So how long has it been happening? That's a big question. And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown them both into the fire and into the water. Can you imagine? I mean, you talk about shocking. I, I remember John Carl. He, he used to say he could swim, and he couldn't swim. <laughs> I can remember one day, he's like, he walked on water. He like said, I can swim. And we're like, oh, he's like, no, you can't. And he's like, and he, I mean, he got out and all of a sudden he goes down like a rock. 
And it took us a second to react. I mean, we're like in shock that this kid who cannot swim thinks he can't. No, he's two or three. I don't know how old he was, but, but I mean, then, you know, you're diving in with your clothes on. I mean, you talk about a, but then thrown into the fire, into the water. I mean, this is, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. 23, Jesus said to him, now this is the real key. And, and let me tell you something, this is something, because because like this man, when he says, I believe, help thy unbelief, this is where we're at. Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. You mean cystic fibrosis? You mean, yeah. Man. I mean, I've seen things that I didn't have faith for. The biggest miracles I've seen, massive physical miracles, I did not have the faith for, but God had the compassion for, and he operated uh, in and through the people around me and me in ways that, I, I mean, my faith has grown because I've seen Jesus honor his word even when I never dreamed he would. I don't know. I mean, I, again, I knew it was in the Bible. I just never dreamed I would see it, etc. But there is an invitation to have confidence in God, to, to have such a deep trust in God, his nature, and his character, in such a profound way that anything that we pray, and it would be, of course, according to God's will, because you don't get this kind of faith or what James calls the prayer of faith, this prayer which you absolutely know it's going to happen, that comes through deep and profound, intimate contact with God, having listened to God in his word and knowing him by his spirit. Which is why he goes on to say, they just kind of only, I mean, he says, if all, if all you have to do is believe. But then he says, well, all you got to do is pray and fast. Well, which is it? Praying and fasting allows you to know God. It is not a work. Your faith grows because your intimacy with God grows in prayer and fasting. Fasting and prayer are about intimacy. Just as reading the word. What does the Bible say in Romans 10, 17? Uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I can listen and not know what Brent's saying. I said, what? What did you say? Hearing is that I actually get it. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing God. Okay? How do we hear God? How does the primary means in which God speak to us? He speaks to us in the most primary way through his word. And having known him well in his word primarily, we begin to get the forms of the bank of the river to which we can then discern the Holy Spirit because we can make sure we're not being misled because we know the word of God. So we know if something says, go rob a bank, it ain't God. Or sleep with your girlfriend, it's okay. Do you know how many, I mean, I haven't done it recently, but in the 90s, in the early, uh, when I was teaching at Santa Fe, do you know how many young Christians from good churches came and said, well, Jesus told me it was okay to sleep with my girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, no, he didn't. <laughs> but I mean, they, they were hearing demons. They heard a voice. I mean, they weren't, they weren't that, they were crazy, but they weren't that crazy. They were immature and flat, but, 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 but they, were, they were baby Christians in essence. They thought they were more than that. But they didn't understand that just because it's a supernatural voice doesn't make it God. And they had not been obedient to God and growing their faith by hearing God's voice and spending time with God to be able to discern between God's voice and the voice of the flesh and the voice of the enemy, the devil. And the fact of the matter is, as this guy said to me years ago, and I thought he was crazy, but boy, was he right. He said, Ron, the problem is today, people don't know the difference in the voice of God and the voice of the devil. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I smiled, I said, yeah, thank you. Shook his hand, he left. Looking back, boy, was that guy right. Boy, was that guy right. If you can believe. Now look, you cannot believe. Your faith will not grow. You cannot believe and have confidence in God if you have not Heard from God. Romans 10 says, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But by paying careful, deliberate attention. James says, faith without works is dead. Meaning, a faith that has heard from God in his word and has not obeyed God isn't real faith. So the kind of faith that believes and can do what Jesus says here is a faith which has heard from God, been with God intimately, been empowered by his spirit, and obedient to his word and spirit, then all of a sudden some really cool things begin to happen. If you can believe, what does it take to believe? Faith comes by hearing. hearing by the, word of, the, prime, the, the primary nutrient for your faith to grow is to know God's word. 
Well, it's to know God through his word. That's the primary. Then there are specific deliberate things. You know, Lord, should I be a doctor or a lawyer? Where we hear by this, the Spirit lead me. There are things that are, that are not just we need to know God's word. And then in knowing God's word and God by his word, we can then ask and be led and guided in other directions for things that are not explicitly or specifically in his word. If you can believe that presupposes an intimate, obedient lifestyle of someone who is connected with God. Uh, if, you, if you know my word and, and obey me, what, John 17? I'm kind of butchering 15 to 17. But I mean, he says, basically, you've got to, to know his voice and to obey it. Jesus says, if you stay intimately connected with me, everything can happen. Apart from you, you can do nothing. Guess what? Most of the church is doing nothing. What does that tell us? Do the math. It means they don't really know him very well. Apart from you, you do nothing. Okay, so what do we say a church that does do nothing? It says we don't really know. There's no sense lying about it. We'll never get any better if we, you know, if I say, well, I'm not I don't really have any weight to lose. Why should I worry about eating ice cream? I don't have any weight to lose. But I'm not going to get any better. I still may not get any better. I still may not choose to do it. But if I'm in denial, the church is in denial. It is powerless. People say, well, that was not for, that was for back then, not today. Wait a minute. The Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, right? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then what? Teach them to obey everything what? I commanded you. Oh, you mean he commanded them to heal the sick? He commanded them to raise the dead, to cast out demons? He commanded them to do all these different things? He told them that the progression of discipleship is that what he invested and poured into them and the way that he taught them in a relationship with him and with the Spirit, they were to replicate and teach that same intimate relationship with the next generation. And the next generation, you're to teach. So, I mean, I can't tell you how many churches that don't believe in healing or, you know, denial. And, and they love that verse. And they only listen to the first part. Preach the gospel. Okay. And, and baptize. We'll do that. But what? We don't, Jesus didn't call us to make converts. He made us, called us to make Disciples. Disciples are taught, and you don't teach primarily by telling. Telling is only one part. Jesus told them. He showed them. He did it with them. He watched them. He released them. He debriefed with them. He sent them out again. It was an intimate process. That's how discipleship happens. Discipleship equals time spent. If you can believe... All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried. I mean, you talk about a statement. Like you hear someone write a beautiful song and say, boy, I wish I could have thought of that. How could someone come up with that? Listen to what this guy says. What a beautiful and true thing. I believe, but help thou my unbelief. There's a battle. There's a battle. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, they're going to come and see. Why was he not happy for the crowd to see? Because everything they saw and he knew they were going to refuse it meant it was bringing more judgment on them. That's why he spoke in parables. Because if he spoke directly, they would refuse, shut their hearts, and they would have got harder and harder, and they would be judged by their rejection. By speaking in parables, they kept thinking about it. And some group of them, by thinking about it, the Holy Spirit finally began to open, and all of a sudden, their hearts changed. He didn't want the crowd because he knew the crowd would see the Magic. They would see the power of God, and then they would still reject him, and then they're going to be more judged, more responsible. When Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit. Like, get this on quickly, saying, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. 26. Then the spirit cried out. You know, all the years I've only had one demon cry out like that with a shriek. Oh, what a time that was. And my dear friends listening to this, will listen to this one. Uh, the person is a very faithful listener. Doesn't live here any longer. But boy, it was, uh, it was, it was what a change. What a beautiful thing that happened. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, came out of him, and he became as one dead so that many said, he is dead. I've been in India and other places where the Holy Spirit comes and people get laid out in the spirit, but they're not just resting. They're, a demon is blocking and they're there and they're like, now they're not dead. I, I, if you've ever seen it, you know they're not dead. But I've had things where there'd be hundreds of people and no one's going to let you pray for the next person because they want to make sure this person is dead. 
<laughs> Susan and I went to play the Southern Indian one time. And uh, literally, they're all watching. And then finally the person comes up and they're healed. And they're like, oh, and the crowd cheers. Then, then you keep praying again. But the next time it happens, it's not like they learn from the first one. Each time until the person lives, no one else is getting prayed for. They're not trusting, they're not t- t- uh, taking a chance with you unless the person lived. I thought they were sort of kind of figured out, but there was no, they, uh, they didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have a real convincing look about me apparently. All right. And he became as one dead so that many said he is dead, 27. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. Beautiful. And when he came into the house, his disciples, now, we don't ever, you know, we don't, none of us like to say, you know, we don't have a clue what was going on. Having a little bit of humility is good. I, I'm impressed that these guys had enough humility with all their weaknesses to ask the question. Because so often we don't want to be, exp- we don't want people to know we didn't know. Hey, we don't know, we don't know, better to ask. And so look, he says, uh, why can't we cast it out? What was wrong? Now he just told them, if you can believe, everything's possible as you believe. And he says, he said then, these kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Meaning, why could he do it? Because he got away and spent that kind of intimate time with the Father. He had a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. And he was modeling for them. When they were falling asleep, he was praying. Right? He had a whole lifestyle. And so he said, if you will enter into a lifestyle and take to have a lifestyle that can walk in that kind of authority, you have to have patterns of holiness. You have to be part of disciplines of things like silence and, and fasting and, and reading and study and meditation. And, you know, I'm trying to memorize, memorize Colossians 3, 1 to 17. And the only thing I do is I just keep writing it the day I wrote down like two or three times. And I still, the problem is, I know the King James, the New King So I decided that I, I changed. I, first, I started to memorize the New King James. I decided that I prefer uh, the NIV, I think, because I like it says, since then, you were raised with Christ. Set your mind on things above, not on, or set your things on things above where Christ is. See at the right hand of God. Set your, uh, set your mind, uh, heart first. It says, verse 2, set your mind on heavenly things not on earthly things, et cetera, et cetera. So, but I mean, I've, I've got about seven verses, but, but then I get it mixed up because I start quoting it the wrong way. So I'm just going to have to keep writing and writing and writing. But for whatever reason, this season of my life, the Lord is asking me to get back to things like memorizing passages of Scripture, not just a verse, but a, a passage so that I can be meditating on an airplane. I can be meditating on a way to appointment on chunks of Scripture, not just all script, but key chunks of Scripture. And uh, it's benefited me just in the hassle. But I can't believe a kid who used to be able to memorize things for, you know, just for a piece of candy, it's a little harder these days. <laughs> it's a little harder taking some work. But boy, what I, I, I'm seeing a benefit. I'm seeing a benefit already, but I've still got a ways to go. This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fast. It's going to take a lifestyle. There are some things that you can just try and the Lord will let you see. And there are some things, though, that they happen because what? This kingdom comes by violence. And and, and people take it by force. There is a battle. And there are some things that we will only be able to lay hold of to those who are earnest and committed and sincere and allow Jesus to strip some things away so that we can get deeply into him. We are hidden in Christ. We are hidden with Christ in God, Colossians 3 says. And and to, to live in that, takes some decisions on how we're living our lives. And those decisions of obedience express our faith and our belief. And to those who believe, all of a sudden, the door of what is possible is getting bigger and bigger. Jesus says there's no end to it. I tell you what, just a little bit. There's people with a far more anointing than me, but but just a little bit can get pretty daggone exciting. But Jesus is inviting me and he's inviting you into deeper and deeper intimacy. But it will take some decisions to have a lifestyle uh, of intimacy with the Father. Uh, And there's some predictable things part of that. Here, prayer and fasting. Paul says in Romans, a faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You want to hear God, you got to know God's voice. You got to know his ways. And then you can begin to hear his spirit and not be misled by false spirits. Uh, there's other things that we, you know, that's not the only things, but those are some of the main things. So tonight we want to pray for you. We want to, uh, we want to be incredibly eager and expectant in our faith for what God can do.
At the same time, uh, we want to recognize uh, that we have a lot, to, a lot to learn, and there's a lot more good stuff for us. Um, and we want to avoid those people and places that, that uh, would be like the scribes that would bring doubt into everything. Uh, one of the things in that little YouTube video, I forget if it was one of the three guys, uh, I told you it was Todd, Todd White, and do you know the other guys? Dan Moore? Moeller? Okay, I've heard that before. But And one of them talked about a guy that Jesus healed, but he took him out of the city and he said, and don't go back into the city. As if, if he goes back in the city, they're going to talk about his miracle. He's like, don't go back in there because if you get back around, I mean, there's a lot of people that I don't tell them because I know the Bible says, don't throw your pearls before swine. And it, that means it in a meaner way than this. It also is, don't tell people things that you know they're going to reject. I don't tell everybody the same story. There's, there's, le- there's layers of the story because some people I know are open. I know I'm not going to mess them up by saying, we saw people who were like, this guy, you can't, because I, kn- I know that I wouldn't have believed it. So I, re- I, I try to be careful. I want to be wise and circumspect that I'm not expecting people who have no experience with the Holy Spirit to understand or expect and understand. I don't tell people, you know, when they don't, they have a demon. I let them figure it out. You know, when, I, when, when it goes. But if people come up and say, oh, you got a demon. Sometimes it's very apparent. But I've had a whole bunch of them. Start, I become the problem. I ain't the problem. So I realized, don't tell them. If they come for prayer, just deal with it. And then some of them don't want to know. They're just glad to be better. And some want to know. And you teach them. But we have to be wise. We have to be careful not being around people of unbelief, uh, not being talked out of things God's teaching us. Walk with humility. Spending the time cultivating intimate relationship. How wonderful it is that we have so many people here tonight even that have been on this journey of learning to walk in intimacy and believe in God. And uh, I mean, a n- large number of the people here tonight have prayed and seen God do miracles. Have cast out demons. How wonderful. How wonderful. Uh, we want to spur each other on for good works and to really keep going. There's a good day coming. Uh, a really, I, I think there's a, the picture lately I've been getting is a, a, a story my mentor told me, Dwayne Elmer, back when he was a missionary in South Africa. He told me at Wheaton College 30 years ago. But he, he talked about different cultures, and he was telling this beautiful story. And uh, he said that, you know, in, in Western culture, when we have a, a marathon, we celebrate the guy who wins or the woman who wins. Everyone cheers. He said in Africa, when the tribes that he was working with, he said when they would run the marathon, nobody cheered until the last person cross the line. He said, because for them, the win was not that one person won, but that everybody crossed the line. So the win didn't take place until everybody. I I feel like in a way that he was not talking about what I'm now using, but I feel like there's a win coming. And the win is that that the church in a much bigger level of not just the few anointed people, uh, and and I think there always be those wonderful anointed people, but but that the church is going to begin to walk and operate in, in their responsibility and, and that uh, you don't have to be a pastor, just, just a disciple of Jesus, that there's a whole lot more people who will be doing these things profoundly and wonderfully, who will, who will be invited to this by Jesus. He's working and calling people by his spirit and people who say, yes, I'm willing to, to live for you and to spend time and to, and to, to follow you and to be your disciple uh, in the way in which you say and they're going to then walk in the, the kind of anointing that comes when we know God. So you don't have to have a gift of healing. What did Jesus say? He didn't say, well, if you have a gift of healing, you can do anything. That's not what he said. People have gifts of healing where they uniquely can do things. But he said that the principle of healing, for example, you need no gift of healing or deliverance. Though they, I'm not, I believe people have it. But look what he said. Basically, if anybody is in intimacy with God, healing and deliverance, it's, it's game for them. So, and that's what I think. I think the baseline, what everybody can do is probably far more than we're seeing most people that we think are anointed doing. Because he puts these kinds of basic ministries, preaching the gospel, healing the broken hearted, casting out demons, healing bodies, restoring families and generations. He says that's the main thing that every disciple is part of. That's Luke 4. That's the main thing. Now, some people are going to be special, but, but meaning everybody gets to, we know everybody gets to play in those things. We're not seeing that, although I think we are beginning to see it more and more. And I think that's the day we're in. Everyone gets to cross the line together. And that's what we, we need to understand. The win is the church that's equipped. 
Um, and we need to put our energies to that direction. So Lord Jesus, we thank you and we pray tonight. Uh, Lord, that tonight, that your kingdom would be manifest. And, and Lord, we pray that you'd help us, both those who are uh, praying and receiving. But Lord, we want to be people who are so confident in you because we know you. We know you intimately through your word and your voice by your spirit. Lord, we've learned to hear you in the lives of other Christians. Lord, we've learned to discern the circumstances which you're bringing about. And, and so, Lord, we're able to absolutely lay hold of these wonderful things uh, healings and deliverance and things that would be impossible in natural order, but because of you and the belief and knowledge of you, it can happen. Oh, Lord, we, 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 we say like this, God, oh, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. And Lord, help us to see that our unbelief is uh, a symptom of choices often that we're not making. That, that it's, it, it's not that we're choosing deliberately uh, against healing, but, but the way we spend our time, the decisions that we make, uh, that in all kinds of other ways, we're choosing a life without intimacy with you. And therefore, uh, we are forfeiting what's possible. So Lord, help us. Uh, we pray, Lord, bring conviction and, 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 and grace into our lives as we believe and obey you. We ask these things in your mighty and wonderful and gracious name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay. Did you notice that no one...